What's up, everyone? Welcome to the latest episode of the Hashkey Learn series, where we speak to experts and professionals in the crypto industry to understand the most pressing and important subjects in the world of digital assets. Now, today I am again welcomed by my colleague and good friend of the show, Henry Santiero, Senior Research Manager at Hashkey Capital, to talk about the Ethereum merge. Now, in what is regarded as one of the most historic and important technological upgrades in crypto history, the Ethereum merge is finally upon us, um, and it is expected to complete its full transition from the proof-of-work mechanism to proof-of-stake in around mid-September, which sets the network up nicely for future upgrades with regard to scalability and making the network much less energy-intensive. Now, Henry, now we've been talking about the merge a lot. It's finally here. Mm -hmm. Now, can you rehash us some of the details? What exactly is the merge? Like, like what is merging together? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Jason. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. No, no problem. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think we already said everything. We can finish this uh, session today. <laughs> <laughs> well, yep, that's it. The, the merge is basically merging the proof of stake chain that already exists. It's called the Beacon Chain mm -hmm. and is live since December 2020. Yep. with the current Ethereum blockchain that is proof of work. So in mid-September, these two different chains are going to merge together. Mm -hmm. The Beacon chain so far has only the consensus mechanism, proof of stake, yep. so it doesn't have transactions and data. And what's going to happen mid-September is that the current Ethereum blockchain that has the transactions and data and so on is going to merge with this proof of stake chain, mm -hmm. and it is going to abandon the proof of work part. And this is going to open doors to a lot of future possibilities. And like you said, it's going to open doors for future scalability with charging. Yeah, well, definitely. Well, as of recording this video, um, well, Ethereum is now anticipated to complete the merge on or around September 14th to 15th, 2020. So let's see how accurate that will be um, at, the terminal at the terminal total difficulty of uh, 5875 followed by 19 zeros. Well, well, Henry, can you tell us on that specific day of the merge, what exactly will happen? And as a normal holder of ETH, um, is there anything that people should be doing? Um, for example, uh, should they transfer their ETH to somewhere? Um, can you tell us more? Mm, great, great mm. thing. Um, yeah, I will start with the second part of your question. Okay. Normal users don't need, don't need to do anything. You just, your Ether is going to be exactly the same. And that's why in terms of terminology, the Ethereum developers decided to stop calling it ETH2 or Ethereum 2.0 because it was cause, causing a little bit of confusion. Mm. People were thinking, oh, so there is a different token? No, it's everything the same. From the user perspective, you don't need to send it to a new wallet. You don't need to exchange it to ETH2. It's, everything is the same from a user perspective. And also after the merge, if you want to do a transaction, you want to send Ether to someone else, or you want to send a token, exactly the same. Uh, also, if you are a smart contract developer, mm. after the merge, 99.9% .9 of the things are going to be exactly the same. The same way you deploy a smart contract nowadays, it will be exactly the same post-merge. Mm -hmm. And you can actually already test this by using one of the test nets that already completed the merge. The Guerli testnet is a testnet that yep. you can use, already uh, completed the merge, already have all these updates, and the way you deploy a smart contract, it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. well, good to know. Well, I, I want to go back to your point about the thing that users don't need to do anything when it comes to uh, uh, during the time of the merge. And because this Ethereum upgrade is just such a high profile event in the crypto industry, there's bound to be lots of scams and malicious activities that may prompt you to, for example, when you receive a suspicious email with regards to transferring your assets to somewhere, you know, please be aware that these are all scams and you don't need to do anything when it comes to uh, your if you're an asset. So one thing to keep in mind. Well, Henry, you mentioned about smart contract developers, right? Can you tell us also about uh, the node operators and validators? What should they do or yeah. what are they going to do? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we start by talking about the proof of work miners, mm. uh, basically proof of work around mid September, yep. once the merge, once we hit the total terminal difficulty, uh, proof of work will be will become basically infeasible, and that's the moment when we transition from proof of work to proof of stake. 
So basically proof of work miners will have to abandon uh, the Ethereum blockchain, it will become infeasible to mine Ethereum and they can transition to Ethereum Classic or ETHW, something mm -hmm. like that. On the other hand, if you are a proof of stake validator, you have to update, pre-merge, you have to update your consensus client and execution client to the new versions. These versions are already released. And basically, if you are watching this video at the moment, you can already upgrade your Ethereum nodes. Now, my next question is, how can users run an Ethereum node? Do they have to stake uh, 32 ETH in order to run a node? Great question. So if you want to run a validating node, a node that is proposing blocks to the blockchain, you need to stake the 32 ETH. Okay. But you don't need to do that if you want to just run a regular nodes just to verify transactions. So if you are just you want to contribute to the network or you have a DAP and you want to have your uh, own nodes, you know, remember people always say uh, don't trust, verify. And the best way to verify is actually by having your own nodes, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to be fully decentralized and fully don't trust, verify, uh, you can deploy your own nodes and run your own node and have it fully synchronized with the network. Or just for hobby reasons, you may also want to deploy your own node. I used to run an Ethereum node and I was not, like, not really mining mm -hmm. the same way you can deploy now an, an Ethereum node and not be a, a staker. Although you are not proposing and validating transactions, it's still, you are still contributing to the healthiness of the network. Yeah. For for different reasons. One is your node is contributing to keep uh, the ledger more decentralized, the Ethereum ledger more decentralized. Your node is also one more, let's say, torrent, one more uh, peer on the network contributing to uh, seed data to other nodes. So when a new node comes online or when you have a, a light wallet in your a mobile phone, for example, these wallets also need to synchronize with the network. And if you are running a non-validating node, you are still contributing to those things. Let's say for some reason, a number of validating nodes go offline and your non-validating nodes doesn't go offline. Once the other nodes become uh, offline again, your node will help them to uh, self-healing, to oh, do okay. the self-healing of the network and synchronize again. So it's always good and contributes to the network to run a node, even if you are not staking. So after the merge, a lot of people are asking, can I immediately unstake my Ether? And if not, when can people start withdrawing their staked Ether? Mm, that's a great question. Mm. Uh, I think some people are afraid, oh my God, after the merge, maybe all these people that are staking, they are going to dump their ETH in the market yeah. and I'm and going the to price crash will, the price. The price will crash, yeah. Yeah, so. that's not <clears> going to happen. It's actually impossible to happen for two main reasons. Mm. First, uh, you cannot immediately start unstaking post-merge. We need to wait for the Shanghai upgrade, which is going to happen six to 12 months after the merge. And after that, uh, you need to queue up to be able to unstake. So queue basically, okay. yeah. So. This is a mechanism that is important to keep the number of validators on the network relatively stable mm -hmm. and uh, so that you don't have like someone uh, gaining a lot of power or just withdrawing from the network as a validator all in the center. Right? Yeah, of course. So the, the limits are approximately six validators can enter or exit the Ethereum network mm -hmm. every 6.4 minutes. 6.4 minutes is one epoch on the Ethereum network. And at each epoch, you can have a maximum of six validators entering or leaving. Meaning that even if you start, if you want to withdraw your stake and uh, you withdraw your 32 ETH, you mm -hmm. will need to queue up. And it may take days, weeks, or even months depending okay. on how many people are trying to understand mm -hmm. their ETH. Okay. Well, it's good to know that the developers, they actually have these me uh, mechanisms in place in order to prevent, as you mentioned, people queuing up and withdrawing everything at the mm -hmm. same time. Now, Henry, it's so well and good saying, oh, the Ethereum merge is one of the most significant events in crypto history. But, you know, give us 
like explain to us what does this actually mean for the wider crypto ecosystem like why is this hailed by many people in the crypto community as such a sacred event that people have been looking forward to for quite a while yeah um i think ethereum is going to set a new standard in the crypto community uh, from one size ethereum you can, you can see ethereum has the a treasury bonds mm-hmm. of the internet okay Post merge, so post merge, uh, we go away from proof of work to proof of stake. Mm. Energy consumption will be reduced by ninety nine point nine percent. Yeah, and the validators will receive a yield, will receive a reward for validating, and this is really considered a treasury bond of the internet because Ethereum is is the biggest uh, and most decentralized chain at the moment. Uh, at the time of the recording, we have around 400,000 validators uh, earning these yields. And this will st- set the new standard for uh, yield generation on the internet, like really like a treasury, US treasury bonds, but on the internet mm. in, in a more decentralized, of yep. course, manner. Um, and these treasury bonds is going to pay in perpetuity, right? So in normal bond, you, it pays like five, 10 years, you discount the coupons and all that stuff. But imagine a bond that pays two, three, four, five, 10%. We don't know exactly how much because it will depend number of validators, number of transactions and transaction fees and so on, but Mm -hmm. it will pay these in perpetuity. So I think it's going to set a new standard for yield generation on the internet. On the other hand, uh, I think it will also help a lot in terms of adoption and open doors for many different institutions to bring their dApps, decentralized applications to the crypto space. Uh, again, like it's going away from proof of work to proof of stake, environmentally friendly, ESG, pays a yield. It's going to be so much more solid. And I think it's going to open doors for many more use cases and, uh, and more developers and institutions to embrace crypto. Mm. And now we've arrived at misconception moments in which every single episode we break down the most common myths and misconceptions with regards to that specific crypto subject. Uh, Henry, obviously there are lots of questions people are asking about the merge. Um, So the first one or the very first common misconception that people might believe is gas prices or transaction fees will drop, will decrease after the merge. Can you uh, debunk that for us? Yes, I, I I want to debunk the misconceptions about the misconceived misconceptions that you have at the moment in the okay. market because, uh, okay, that's a great question. Will the transaction fees drop after the merge? And kind of yes and no. I don't want to go against the stream because everyone is saying, no, the gas fees will not improve. And the reality is that they will not improve anything meaningful for the normal users, right? Mm. However, if we want to be really accurate, the reality is that the transaction fees will improve a little bit. Oh, it will, okay. It will. Um, Let's say if you now pay $1 transaction fee, maybe after the merge you'll pay 90 cents. So it's not exactly the same thing. And to be accurate, we need to say that, yeah, maybe they will improve a little bit. And they will improve in two ways. One is the fact that the Ethereum blocks, the average block production will go from 13.3 seconds on average to 12 seconds. Mm -hmm. So it will be 10% faster and with 10% more capacity for transactions. At the end of the year, I was doing some calculations and at the end of one year, post-merge is like 40 million more transactions. Mm -hmm. So it will gain some capacity and consequently, lower a little bit Mm -hmm. the transaction fees just a little bit it's not the same as sharding sharding it will really lower a lot yeah and last but not the least um the merge will result in some network downtime um Mm. can you explain that for us Mm. most likely it will not not. uh, do any downtime Uh, so the merge just to contextualize a bit developers have been talking about this since 2014 you can uh, Google search the um, uh, Vitalik Buterin post from January 2014, where he is already talking about transitioning the chain to proof of stake. Okay. So th- this has been prepared for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And the last one, one and a half years, developers have been 
uh, full time working in doing this merge. There was many many different tests. The test nets also performed the merge updates. Mm -hmm. So this has been really, really tested a lot. Now, uh, there are some other misconceptions that people might be asking, and there's a very useful link on the Ethereum Foundation's website, which you guys can uh, check out as well. Well, Henry, I think that is a good time to end today's discussion. Uh, well, thank you so much again for being here. Now, um, Thanks, if you guys, yeah, no problem. If you guys would like to know exactly the time which in which the emerge is expected to occur, there's a very useful um, link, which is 797.io slash the merge slash, which kind of gives you a estimated time of when exactly the merge will happen down to its um, hour and second, sorry, hour and minute. So uh, be sure to check that out. Well, again, thank you again for being on the show, Henry. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Well, um, if you guys are watching this on YouTube, uh, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. Uh, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. See you next time. Awesome. Well, thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. So, so what do you think we should name name this video? Oh, like, uh, like let's merge? bring some some ideas. Yeah. And we'll see. Like merge time or something, maybe merge hour. I don't know. It's merge time, so maybe. Yeah. Yeah.